Thank you for coming. One of the difficulties with giving a Rembrandt presentation is that one has to talk. His art really can speak for itself. And um, there will be quite a few opportunities to just simply be present uh, to some of the uh, paintings we're going to see today after they're explained. At any time, if you have a question, or if I said something that was not clear, please feel free to ask. <coughs> this is one of his earliest paintings, and I chose it. It's called The Artist in His Studio. And the reason that I chose it is that, oh, let me preface that remark was something else. Almost everything I'm going to say today is conjecture. There's absolute, almost nothing we know of Rembrandt other than his financial uh, interactions. And through that, we know that he had a tram feature. However, Robert said he was a king of hearts with probably vanity and the right use of vanity for Rembrandt or the self-portraits and uh, power. So, because we have the message, and we understand since the prehistorics that the message of consciousness has not changed, we are actually able to look at Rembrandt differently than most people and understand what he was saying to the viewer. He's around 23 years old at this point. And the reason that I chose it is that there are two things. One is the juxtaposition between the artist and the easel. The easel is bigger than life, and the artist, compared to the easel, is quite small. The second reason is, is that there is a mystical glow coming off the easel. And Rembrandt painted his soul on the easel. So it is as if he is at the beginning of his journey of awakening. And here he is, and we will see this compared to the last little portrait, and we will see what one has to go through. Here he is looking at what he has to attain, and he knows that it's much greater than he is right now. However, in the very beginning, Rembrandt uh, just used himself to observe himself, to catch himself in different states. Now, through some of these images, because we're limited in time, some of these images we will go th through rather quickly. Others we will spend some time on. So, Hugh, let us go. Here he is in the shadows, looking like, what's going on here? He catches himself in this state, and he paints it. Here he is really he has a beggar in the street and uh, laughing, smiling uh, look, and everything that he sees uh, in the mirror he puts on canvas. Rembrandt did feel that the role of the artist was to be true to what he sees and everything, especially in the later self-portraits, we will see every blemish, every scar, the double chin, whatever it might be. Here he is, just the opposite of what he was. Again, at almost the same age, and he's very <clears throat> dignified. And he's dressed in the modern, uh, in those days, modern clothing of the day, and he's sitting as if he's for a, sitting as if he's in a professional portrait. And then we'll take a look at one more. <coughs> and this is the last one. He, it's as if he's saying, who am I? Now this is the last one we're going to look at, and I just wanted to give you really, a, 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 as an introduction, an overview of how he used the canvas for his work. There is a story that when Rembrandt was in his studio painting, the king of the world could come knocking at the door, and they would have to wait until Rembrandt finished his painting. Uh, he would not interrupt any, uh, he would not stop for anything. If there was one word that I had to use to describe Rembrandt or his life, it would be transformation. And we're going to see this transformation from this uh, to consciousness. 
over the course of this presentation. Rembrandt had to transform uh, tremendous, tremendous uh, friction and emotional suffering. In 1634, Rembrandt was married and his wife gave birth to four children between 1634 and 1642. Three of the four children died before they were three months old. The fourth child, Titus, was born in 1642 and he survived, but Saskia, Rembrandt's wife, Titus's mother, died in 1643 because of the severity of the childbirth. Rembrandt is doing extremely well, and truly, nobody knows where the money went. Um, he bought a huge house on a very wealthy street, and he had no time payments. He could pay it whenever he wanted, up to 15 years. Well, you give Tram Feature 15 years to do something, they'll do it in 20. Um, but So he has all these debts, but we don't know why, because we don't know what he did with all the money. People were waiting in line for three months to have him paint their portrait. Now something very special happens that's quite curious. There is now, when Rembrandt was 40 years old, which is 1649, there is not one painting, drawing, or etching dated 1649. It's as if for that one year, he made an aim to go against what he loves, which is using his art. And what comes out in 1650 is the following. January 1650, he etches, <laughs> that's it. He etches an empty shell and that's in January of 1650. This is the first thing he does after a year of no painting. And it's as if he's saying, uh, just like nature reflects consciousness with the butterfly and the caterpillar, the empty shell is what he was, and what is real is no longer part of him. It is as if in 1649 he may have crystallized. Again, I'm saying this as conjecture, and we will see this because in the next image, not yet, but in the next image, it is the first self-portrait that he does in 1650. And art critics say, without their understanding, that there's something different about the mass of the man in his 1650 portraits following for the next 19 years. So this is the next, um, this is the first thing that he did. And he also did one other thing before we go to that image. Go ahead. This is it, sorry. This is the 1650 self-portrait. And he's at his desk doing some kind of etching or drawing, but his face and his intentions and attention is black. <laughs> There we go. Okay. Um, his, his focus, his eyes, are quite different than before. And he is looking out at us almost without emotion. He's painting exactly what he sees. And later on, his art critics will say, towards the end of his life, his self-portraits were as if he was out of his body painting what he saw from his body. So it is possible that in 1650 was the year that he awakened. At any point, again, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Let's go to the next one. This is also from 1650. And what is interesting about this is that other than the first self-portrait that we saw with the artist in the studio, this is the only time that he does a full self-portrait as if to say, 
I am complete. I am full. After 1650, Rembrandt's fortunes, and again, we have no understanding as to why, went south, and he lost a tremendous amount of money. He was unable to pay his debts, and in 1655, he had to sell all of his possessions to pay off some, just some of his creditors. And there is an exact detail of to about four typewritten pages of everything that he owned. And Rembrandt would spend money quite uh, lavishly on art. And he felt it was the responsibility of the artist to raise the price of art and to collect it. And Amsterdam was one of the busiest ports in those days, and everything that came from Italy came through Amsterdam. So he was very familiar, especially with the Titians, and he also, of course, knew Ruben. So by 1657, he had declared bankruptcy. He had to move out of his house, and he moved to the uh, edge of town and lived in some kind of small accommodation with his uh, lover and his son Titus. He never married his lover. Her name was Hendrik. And yet he drew, a, which we will not see, a beautiful portrait of her. And just above her bosom, coming out of the blouse of her bosom, is a ring, as if to say, although we were not married, she was my wife. Very, very emotional. So in 1657, he loses everything. And we would think that his self-portraits would reflect this. But the next self-portrait that comes out in 1658 is this. Oh, no. <laughs> actually, this is a self-portrait. That's why I put it up there. I actually think this is a self-portrait with sarcasm. It's like he's the slaughter. It's called the slaughtered ox. And, it's his, and the ox seems crucified. And it's as if Rembrandt was crucified in 1657. And he painted this with a sense of humor. And here, if you can see, I don't know if you can see, but there's a woman peeking out at the crucifixion. I don't know what she represents. But this is a jovial body, and Rembrandt was a jovial. And it is just my understanding that uh, this was his sense of humor. But again, we have to remember now, he has no money, he's impoverished, and then in 1648 we have this beautiful self-portrait that's hanging in the frick. He paints himself as the prince of the world. He's wealthy, this is the most lavish he does with himself. He's sitting on a throne with his scepter and he has all these gold colors. It's as if he totally transformed something and it was his life and then once again if you take a look at all the blemishes he kept everything honest what he saw he painted and it was again because we have the understanding of the message he was totally not identified with what he saw with what he was We're going into another phase right now, but let me stop here if there are any questions. Okay. We're going to do, although his self-portraits leave a certain kind of message, and we will return to the self-portraits, the other form of his painting that leaves a tremendous amount of wisdom on canvas for us to really harvest are his biblical paintings. And we are going to take a look at a few. I was only able to do a sprinkling because, again, we are a little bit time, uh, time sensitive. But I brought out those uh, biblical paintings that I, fought, that I thought would express the inner man. This is the raising of the cross. Rembrandt. This is a self-portrait. Rembrandt put himself in that painting because he knew, or he felt, that if he were living in those days, his lower self <coughs> could
could have been at the crucifixion, supporting the crucifixion, and raising the cross. Let's go to the next one to detail. This is him at the image. Rembrandt being true to life about his face, he allows the blood to flow freely. He is not afraid of gore. Absolutely not. And so here is his face telling the viewer the lower self is capable of anything. However, he does redeem himself in the next painting. This is the descent from the cross. He's coming down from the cross and this is Rembrandt again. And now he's saying, yes, I could have crucified him, but also I would have received him gently and lovingly from the cross. And he's giving us a wonderful juxtaposition between the lower self and the nine of hearts, or the inner chamber of the heart. In Rembrandt's painting, usually the person in the highest state has a mystical light shining on them. And in this painting, it's called The Woman Taken in Adultery. And for uh, maybe 1,200 years or more, it was thought that that was Mary Magdalene, but that is an error. Um, the story comes after Mary Magdalene's story in the New Testament, but it's definitely not Mary Magdalene. This woman is accused of adultery. And the Pharisees are over here, and he has the priests, which are called the Sadducees, up here. And the first thing he's showing is the pomposity, if that's the word, of the priesthood. And that was a big complaint uh, for the Essenes who left the temple and lived that near the Dead Sea in a monastic life because they felt the priests were corrupt and that they were corrupting the teachings of the Mosaic law. And here you have the Pharisees, and one of the Pharisees is saying to him, uh, yo, Jesus, this woman was taken in adultery. <clears throat> what do you think we should do? The Bible says, or the law says, we have to stone her to death. And according to the story, Jesus kept drawing in the sand, because he was sitting in the, uh, down at the time, this is poetic artistic license. And according to Robert, he was writing down the features of all the Pharisees uh, that were in front of him. And he comes up with this brilliant statement. And Jesus says to the Pharisees, let he who has not sinned cast the first stone. And one by one, they leave. And the woman is experiencing this incredible amount of compassion and forgiveness. And he tells the woman, go and sin no more. And so once again, this mystical light, we don't even know where it's coming from, which is one of Reverend's geniuses, is shining on someone having the highest state. Now before we go any further, there is a jack of hearts, which I'd like to share, a uh, response to this. When Jesus says, let he who has not sinned cast the first stone, an older woman comes with a huge boulder and throws it on this woman. And Jesus looks at this woman and says, Mom, I thought I told you to stay home. <laughs> she has not sinned, she's the Virgin Mary. Okay, we'll leave that out of the present day. <laughs> so, <laughs> Let us go to the next one. <laughs> this is magnificent. This is in the Metropolitan in New York. And in theory, it's Arista. It's called, Rembrandt didn't title his paintings. The art critics did. And so they said, oh, this is Aristotle contemplating the bust of Homer. But actually, this is much more. This is a struggle between the higher and lowest self. Aristotle was falsely accused, along with his uncle, of trying to poison Alexander the Great. He was the tutor to Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great, because he was his tutor, gave him a gold uh, chain, which is what people who worked in the royal court received. 
And so here's Alexander, uh, here's Aristotle with the gold chain that he received from Alexander. But if you can follow his gauge, his gaze, it is not on Homer at all. It's as if he's going through something. And Aristotle has to make a decision. He knew that Homer was conscious, and all of these are his works, and he felt that Homer was the greatest poet up to that point that had lived. And according to tradition, we don't know for sure, Homer was blind. So Rembrandt paints no light by Homer's eyes. And yet, Aristotle has to determine or decide if he's going to follow the life of A influence, the life of materialism, or the life of C influence, the life of spirituality. And here Rembrandt captures on the face what's going on inside of him. And this is again one of Rembrandt's brilliant, uh, brilliant skills to be able to do what's going on here and follow, paint it here. The decision actually was made for him. Alexander the Great sent people to arrest both him and his uncle. So Alexander, uh, Aristotle had to flee. And nothing brings you closer to God than running for your life. And so he embraces, of course, as we know, the, uh, the life of consciousness. And his uncle actually is caught and is put to death. I'd like you to take a look at this painting and the next painting, which will be in a moment, and try to see if you notice any difference. This is Joseph being accused of, of raping Potiphar's wife. Potiphar worked for Pharaoh in the high court, and he was the captain of Pharaoh's guard, and he was away for a couple of days, and his wife went after Joseph, who in the Bible said he was a very good-looking man. And so she invited him into her bedroom, and he uh, goes in not knowing what he want, what she wants, and she says to him, lie with me. And he said, no, you are married. And as he runs out, she grabs him and grabs his uh, robe, and he runs out nude. And so she says, when her husband comes home, Joseph tried to rape me, and for proof, here's his robe. Now this is a story, and this was painted and the next painting was painted in the same year. Let's go to the next one, Q, please. Has anyone noticed any difference between this painting, we'll look at it for a few more, uh, minute or so, and the other one? You wanna go back to the other one? Okay. It's not like uh, Joseph is objecting here. Exactly right. He, let's go back to the other one. Here, Joseph is saying, hey, I'm innocent. Come on. <laughs> I didn't do this. <laughs> and Rembrandt said, no, this is a mistake. Joseph would not do this. Let's go. Joseph would accept his fate as the will of the gods. And here he is, total acceptance of what the gods have in store. And sure enough, he's thrown into prison, but he's brought out of prison uh, later on into the court of Pharaoh because he's able to interpret dreams. And Pharaoh has him interpret the dreams of the seven fat cows and the seven skinny cows. It's a little bit beyond our scope right now, but I just wanted to show you that Rembrandt, when he understood something, put it there. And we can't understand why in the same year he would paint the same thing, except through the understanding of following the will of the gods, knowing that life is a play, and he must accept it. There is a follow. Without resentment. There is a follow around him. Yes, there, there seems to be an aura around him. Yes, that's true. Okay, well, let's go to the next one. To me, this is the greatest painting in the world. Um, it is in the Hermitage, and he painted this uh, a few years before his death, and it is the return of the prodigal son. And so very quickly, a man had two sons, a very wealthy man, 
and the youngest son got tired of working for the father in the fields, and he says, you know what, give me my inheritance now. I want to go out and see the world. And so he goes out, he receives his money, he goes out, and in a short period of time, he spends it all drinking, gambling, and being with women. And he finds himself eating with the pigs, stealing their corn. And so he says to himself, his king of hearts finally wakes up and says, you know, let me go back to my father's house. Not as his son, because I'm not worthy to be his son. But let me go back as a, an employee, because I will get three meals and I will get a roof over my head. And so Rembrandt captures the moment when the son meets the father. The father sees the son coming from afar, and he tells his servants, go and kill the fattest calf we have, we're going to have a feast. And the oldest son becomes very queenie and resentful, and he says, wait a minute, I never left, I never took any of your money, I never gambled, drank, or been with women, and uh, you never killed a fat calf for me. And the father said, everything I own is yours, but it is right to celebrate because your brother was dead, but now he is alive again. You let's go to the next, it's a detail of this. The reason I detail this is for twofold. One, if you can see the incredible gratitude and contentment that Rembrandt was able to put on the face of the son. No inner considering because the father did not give him any guilt did not judge him. And the other reason I did it as a detail is that these hands on the son's shoulder, shoulders is a tremendous act of love and compassion. Those hands are so gentle and forgiving. And it is as if the father represents consciousness, the third state of consciousness, the higher self, and the son is the steward. And what is being said here, any time that the steward wishes to evoke the higher self, it is available. In the Gospels, Paul wrote, draw near to God, and God will draw near to you. And this is the steward drawing near, and you can tell he's never going anywhere again. He's totally content, and the father, his face is just glowing with forgiveness and gratitude as well. Once again, Rembrandt highlights people's suffering. We saw the prodigal son earlier, and here Moses is coming down with the Ten Commandments, and he sees the people, he was going for 40 days and 40 nights, he sees the people worshiping a golden calf, and he loses it, and uh, he breaks the commandments. Rembrandt, in theory, learned the Hebrew alphabet from a rabbi, a very uh, well-known rabbi living across his street, and his name was Manasseh ben Israel, and the rabbi was also a Kabbalist. Again, we don't know who was Rembrandt's teacher, but in theory, he worked directly with the gods, and he awakened through their efforts. However, he did study with Manasseh ben Israel, but we don't know what, other than the Hebrew language. And so Rembrandt captures the moment of total disappointment when Moses sees that everything, all the goodness that God had given has been forgotten by the people, by the lower self, and they start worshiping the golden calf. This is the second of the five, of the last five commandments, and the first of the f uh, first four. And biblical scholars who knew Hebrew, they studied this quite clearly, and they said he only made one mistake with the lettering. I cannot tell you which one it is. Yes, I cannot read it from here. Uh, it's the let, letter Tet. 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 Uh, tet. 
it, it is that means it's sin. It is, and this one is omitted. Uh, I, I have a study for a moment. I can I studied it okay. carefully. I can say. I appreciate that. Echo. Okay. Any any questions so far? <coughs> Once again, we will have an opportunity for silence, but I just want to get the words out so you'll know what you're silent about. <clears throat> Jacob's wrestling with the angel. Yisrael, the word Yisrael or Israel means struggling with God. And after Jacob struggles with the angel, his name is his name is changed from Jacob to Israel because he has struggled with God and he has survived. And so the children of Israel, the land of Israel, the people of Israel, all of that came from this struggle. And the angel, in theory, who was an angel, you could see he has the love and the compassion on, 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 on Jacob. And Jacob is struggling as hard as he can to defeat him, but he cannot. And the angel touches the hip of his of the inner thigh, and he wounds Jacob. And after that, Jacob walks with a limp. And this is why uh, that part of the sinew of the thigh, uh, Jews do not eat of the, any animal in honor of this struggle. <coughs> so again, there is this silent love from the angel towards Jacob, towards that struggle with that fighter. This is Susanna and the Elders, and it was written around the 4th century or 3rd century BC, and it's part of the Apocrypha. And um, I put this in, he painted it twice. <clears throat> what is happening is that Susanna is a wife, a very wealthy man, and the judges of Israel used to use his garden where they would sit during the day and hear trial cases. And these are two judges. Um, who were in the garden, and they both loved Susanna, but they didn't tell each other. And they both waited until after everybody left one day and hid in the bushes. And they waited until Susanna was going into her bath. And what happens is that Susanna was so modest, she even sent her female servant away so they would not see her, she would not see her nude. And as soon as she gets uh, undressed, the two uh, elders come down and they say to her, look, we are elders of Israel, sleep with us, or we're going to accuse you of adultery. And she's looking out at us like Rembrandt is looking out, saying, what did I do to deserve this? And she's going, what do I do? I have this suffering and this friction. I'm accused of something that I did not do. And I'm going to have to work with it. And so what happens is that she says, you know, I would rather die than commit adultery. And she's taken to court and there is this man, Daniel, and God says to Daniel, I want you to go to this court and defend this woman. And Daniel says, I can't get to that court in time. And God picks up Daniel and throws him into the courtroom. And he gets there in time. And Daniel asks if he can, in Jewish law, all you needed was two witnesses in order to accuse someone. And if two witnesses said the same thing, the person was guilty. And again, in Judaism, as we saw with the woman who had taken an adultery, the punishment for adultery is to be stoned to death. And so Daniel approaches the court, and evidently the court recognizes him as someone great. And he says, I would like to interview or question the witnesses separately. And he questions the first witness. And the first witness says she, she was with a very strong young man. And when we found her, he pushed us away because he was so strong and ran away. But we saw it. And he says to the uh, witness, under which tree in the garden was the, she having this affair? 
and he said, oh, it was under the orange tree. And he leaves, and he brings in the other witness, and he asks that witness, are you sure you know which tree it was that she committed this sin under? And he said, yes. And I think it was the apple tree, but I'm not 100% sure what, the, what this text says right now. And then the court realizes that the elders were lying. And in Jewish law, if you bring false witness against someone, what you wanted them to get, you get. And so they immediately take the two elders out and they stone them to death. Now, of course, this story never happened, but these are tales of wisdom in the Apocrypha, in, especially in the Apocrypha, that were put in later on, not historically accurate, but to teach about life, about consciousness, about awakening. And there are three stories in the, in the Bible. One is Judith, the other one is Susanna, who kills Holofernes, the, the, uh, the general. And the third is Esther, and none of those three stories are real. They're historically inaccurate, but they were put in to show the nobility of the inner chamber of the heart, of the nine of hearts. And um, in the, um, the Puritan Bible, they did not like the idea that women were getting such good press at the expense of these wonderful men. And so they did not allow these uh, stories to be put in the Protestant Bible of King James. Instead, they petitioned the king, and these stories became put together in a book called the Apocrypha, which means that, that which is hidden, or that which is secret. The Catholic Bible incorporates these stories within the entire Old and New Testament corpus, and, um, but the, but the uh, Protestant Bible does not. We're coming to the end, and we're coming to the last three self-portraits. <coughs> now, the next three self-portraits, no one knows which came first and which came last. Mm -hmm. There is a theory that this is the last one, but most scholars think that this was painted two years before Rembrandt's death in 1667. However, this is a wonderful story, and Rembrandt is looking at us saying goodbye uh, to the co this comedy, the divine comedy. And he paints himself as a Greek artist whose name was Apelles. And what happened was an old woman came to Apelles and asked him to paint her as Venus. Not to paint her, but to sculpt her as Venus. And Apelles laughed so hard that he died. And so here's Rembrandt laughing like a palace, but looking at us and laughing. And here's the image of an older woman who's not that beautiful <laughs> that wishes to look like Venus. Rembrandt uses this for a reason. I don't know what it is. Other than to show everything that happened to him is a divine comedy. And he understood this later on. The next year, assuming this is 1667, the next year Rembrandt loses his only son to the plague, Titus. And so eight months or nine months before Rembrandt dies, he buries the last of his four children. It was as if the gods wished to just uh, crystallize consciousness within him. And he leaves us with the next two paintings. There's nothing left of the man. It just doesn't exist. He's, he's all consciousness. He's, it's as if he just painted the body. Now this for sure is 1669. And I would like us just to take a moment or two of silence to just look at this one, since we do have the time for it.
you remember those remembrance of his early years laughing, catching himself, and he transformed. We're all very naive about the price of awakening. If all of us knew what we were going to have to go through before we signed up, many of us never would have taken that first meeting. And here is Rembrandt. Now, the next one also was painted in 1669. I just want to show it in one form uh, this way. You can see the outline of the lower self. And then this, to my opinion, is the last one. He's done everything. He was asked to transform. And if you study it well enough, there is almost a smirk here, like he's smiling. And he's saying goodbye, totally not identified with what he has become here or what he has gone through in his life. Every person he loved, from his wife to his four children to his lover, he buried. And he was so poor, we, uh, he was buried in the church public a uh, lot. We'll come back to this, but you just keep this in mind and just show the next one, please. This is where he was, where he began to become the canvas. And let's go back. And he's the canvas. He has completed his soul. He has completed his role extremely well. What I would like to do is just leave this up here and whenever you feel like leaving, please feel free. But let's just leave in a quiet state.